yeah before we begin today let me answer a question that was raised which had to do with uh, ergodic sampling sampling and ergodicity uh, the statement made was that if you have a time average you could in principle convert it to an ensemble average if you have ergodicity in the system and this is used in practice in sampling in uh, experiments in physical practice it is used all the time and let me give an analogy for this. Suppose we wanted to measure we have a long roll of wire homogeneous uniform everywhere and we wanted to measure the resistance of this wire of 1 meter of this wire. There are two ways of doing this one of them would be to say I have available to me a single piece a meter long and I measure its resistance and I do this over and over and over again and each time I make this measurement under identical conditions I get a slightly different answer due to various fluctuations and I take the arithmetic average of all these measurements and that would be the time average of this resistance and it gives me a certain number. We are assuming here that this wire does not in any way change its characteristic due to these measurements it does not become old it does not get heated up it does not get aged and so on and so forth. The other way to do this to measure uh, get an accurate value or average value for 1 meter long wire would be to take this long spool of wire and make a measurement for each of those pieces. So the next piece is like this and the next piece is like that and so on and I measure each one of these guys and ask what the average value is. This would be like an ensemble average an ensemble just means a collection a whole set of these identical copies and it is again assumed that these pieces are all identical to each other and that gives me one average value and that may not always be practical to do. You may have available just one meter and no more in which case to get an accurate value you would repeatedly measure the same thing under hopefully identical conditions and then assume that the time average that you get by measuring the resistance of 1 meter of wire a single specimen over and over again is the same as the ensemble average. So this would be an illustration of ergodicity in the sense that you have replaced a time average by an ensemble average. Now what is implied in this whole business in some sense what is implied is that there are certain sources of fluctuations which lead to an answer which is slightly different each time when you make this measurement over and over again some random processes are operating internal external we do not care such that there are fluctuations in the answer when you make this measurement here. The assumption is that the system as time goes along runs through all the realizations of that random process which is leading to the fluctuations which would otherwise be reflected by the small differences in the different samples. In other words whatever fluctuations are going on in time here that is already captured at the same instant of time in the different parts in the different copies or members of the ensemble which is why you equate the two and in dynamical systems as you can see when a system is ergodic it says instead of replacing instead of computing time averages long time average over a trajectory at a given instant of time I compute a phase space average over different portions of phase space with some given measure and that is again the same ergodicity. So it is precisely the same thing that is being done in both places and the hope is that under suitable conditions the random process or whatever else is determining the fluctuations here is such that a time average could be replaced by an ensemble average and this is at the root of all ergodicity. Yes, so absolutely. Is there, is yeah. there any way by which you can find out the system is regarding without actually the time? Yeah, this is a good question, it is a deep question. How do we know a given system is ergodic? First of all, you have to specify a system much more accurately to do this. Given a dynamical system, given the rules of evolution in our context, we can certainly test if a system is ergodic or not. We can run a typical trajectory through or we can use other criteria for ergodicity if we know something about the dynamics, if we know something in detail about whether it is expanding in one direction contracting in another and so on we may be able to prove ergodicity prove ergodicity in a rigorous sense of the word. But in practice coming to this experimental question of 
No, I am assuming that we have a dynamical system for which the equations are given to you, the dynamical system. Ah, there without an explicit solution, there yes. Is there a point in having a yes, oh yes, you can still do that, yeah. You do not need to be able to solve this system completely. You can still prove that it is ergodic. You can still show that it is ergodic. You do not necessarily need to solve the equations explicitly. In fact, in most cases, I cannot solve things explicitly. So, that is not the problem. Proving ergodicity for a given difficult, <coughs> complicated dynamical system is not a trivial matter, but it can be done in principle in most cases. On the other hand, yeah. What, what are the things by which you can? What is the rule by which you can approach it? Because ah, what? Okay. Rule that knows that okay. These two are equal. Okay. The next question is, how do I know? How do I do this? This is going to involve something called coarse graining in phase space, and then looking at what happens as the system visits different parts of phase space. I'll talk a little more about it a little later. So it involves other criteria, other quantifiers for ergodic behavior, which we haven't yet considered such as I break up the phase space into cells sufficiently small cells and keep track of where a representative point is. I can do that numerically without actually solving the equations of motion and then depending on the statistics of how different parts of the phase space are visited and filled up I can decide whether the system is ergodic or not. I can see what the dependence of various visits of the, recur of the statistics of recurrences to various cells and how they change how this thing changes as a function of the cell size that will give me another indication of whether the system is ergodic or not. So there are quantifiers for ergodicity. On the other hand for a purely experimental question such as this uh, the resistance of a piece of wire which I am talking about in practice it is clear you do not have a large copy you do not have a very large sample you certainly do not have 2 kilometers of wire to play with if you did then the ideal thing to do would be to cut it into 1 meter pieces and measure for each one of them what the resistance is and take the arithmetic average. Since you do not have that you take it as an article of faith that whatever fluctuations occur in the remaining portions are all present in a given sample over a period of time given enough time and therefore you use just one sample but you repeatedly make measurements in order to find an average value and then the hope is that these two averages are exactly the same thing if the system is ergodic if it is ergodic. So this is the point of what it in fact when you do statistical mechanics or thermodynamics you are using ergodicity essentially because what is going on is that you put a macroscopic system under given experimental conditions such as for instance in contact with a heat path in thermal fluctuations uh, in, uh, a thermal equilibrium in contact with a heat bath and then you assume that the system is ergodic. In other words a statistical average over a given ensemble with a certain probability distribution is enough to give you long time averages for the system because you cannot follow the trajectories of a complicated set of interacting particles in time. But you assume that whatever information you would have got by doing the time average is already there when you do the ensemble average and then it only remains to write down the correct measure the correct probability distribution and that is the task of equilibrium statistical mechanics. So once again you do precisely that. Now what is the reason why you are able to do this again you do not have an infinite number of copies of an ideal gas in a container although when you derive statistical mechanics or the rules of statistical mechanics you assume you pretend you do and you have an infinite number of copies to take averages over but a given system a single system the gas in this room for example runs through all the realizations of the random processes involved given enough time okay. So this is the whole point for instance in different samples the molecules would be at different positions at the same instant of time and the assumption is given enough time the molecules of a single specimen would run through and assume all those positions. So you certainly have to do an averaging for a sufficient amount of time that you think you have got a satisfactory enough long time average which could then be compared with the ensemble average. Now since equilibration time in systems like this is very very short this is actually true in most cases in practice need not always be true if the relaxation times in the system are extremely small then this is no longer true if the system is extremely sluggish and there are time scales for equilibration or the running through of all the realizations which are much larger than the time scale on which you make measurements then the system could get stuck in one or two preferred configurations and then it is no longer a true average this happens in many systems 
it is called glassy dynamics it again happens once again uh, when you have uh, extremely sluggish systems systems with very complicated what are called very complicated or rugged energy landscapes so you do not have clear free energy minima but you have minima on all local minima on all scales and then the system could get locally trapped in some place and take a long time to get out of it and then of course it is not easy to take averages after that in such situations. So they do these situations do occur in physics everywhere but for us in the study of dynamical systems the equations themselves specify everything. So in principle that is all the information you have and everything has to be derived from there. Okay. So let us go back now and consider what one dimensional maps had to tell us. Um, we looked at the logistic map we looked at it at fully developed chaos and we discovered that it had an invariant measure an invariant density which was non trivial and had a kind of uh, uh, a square inverse square root shape so for the logistic map at mu equal to 4 this was the map f of x equal to 4 x times 1 minus x we had fully developed chaos the Lyapunov exponent lambda was equal to log 2 the same as for the Bernoulli map and the invariant density this was equal to 1 over pi square root of x times 1 minus x okay. So this is where we had got once you have this then it is not hard to compute various physical quantities because the average value of any function of x is simply its weighted average with this invariant density and that is guaranteed to be the long time average and of course you know that apart from a set of points of 0 measure all points in the unit interval lie on chaotic orbits and these orbits wander back and forth without settling down anywhere and they fill up the interval according to this density which looks like this okay. Now there are certain universalities about this map which are common to all one hump maps of the unit interval and we will talk about some of these but there is another phenomenon I would like to talk about today and that is the phenomenon of intermittency. A intermittency comes in many varieties and very roughly speaking it is the phenomenon by which a chaotic system displays periodic behavior in between or apparently periodic behavior instead of being fully chaotic for long intervals of time and then it is followed by bursts of chaos followed by bursts of laminarity which is regular behavior of some kind or approximately periodic behavior. So if you look at the time series of any variable such as x it would not show the truly chaotic up and down zigzag motion in an intermittent situation it would actually show long bursts of periodic behavior and then all of a sudden once again you have chaotic behavior. Now how does this phenomenon arise several routes to intermittency as I pointed out but the simplest one of these is the following and let me draw in pictures and show you what happens. Suppose you had a chaotic one dimensional map here is the bisector which looked like this and this was the map function it is easy to see that in this case you have an a stable fixed point here and an unstable fixed point here where the slope is greater than 1. So if you start with points in between they would end up at this point here if you start at points here it would end up at this stable fixed point. Now suppose you varied a parameter such that this map function as the parameter varied moves up and there comes a stage when it has got a tangency at that place. So the slope is 1 at the point of tangency and then as you vary the parameter further the thing moves out and goes off like that. There may be other portions to this map function but locally in the neighborhood of this point where of tangency suppose it looks like this as you tune a parameter and I will give an example shortly what would happen 
and here is an example right away. Suppose you consider x n plus 1 equal to some constant mu plus x n plus x n squared for instance near the origin. So I have shifted this point to the origin and the map looks like that what would happen well clearly if you had the map near the origin if mu is 0 dead 0 then it is x n plus x n squared and it looks exactly like this there is a point of tangency with slope plus 1 and then it takes off like an x n squared. So this would correspond to mu equal to 0 and this would correspond to positive values of mu but it is just moved off from there completely and this would correspond to negative values of mu. So as you cross mu equal to 0 from left to right the picture would go like this from here to there. Now at this place at this in this situation there is no problem this thing here is a stable fixed point things get attracted to it. At this point you have something that is marginally indifferent marginally indifferent marginally slope is equal to 1 so the fixed point is marginal here as you come in here things would flow into this point but if you started off on this side things would flow out so you would have a behavior like this in here it would go in but if you started here things would give it out. In this situation if I start here I go to this function I come here I go here I go take the staircase route and then I am off. As you can see if this is infinitesimally close to this point the, time, the bisector there is a tunnel region where the system takes a long time to get out of this tunnel region and then eventually it does and does chaotic motion elsewhere and then once it gets trapped in this region again for a long amount of time there is again approximately period regular behavior it is not really going anywhere it is stuck in this tunnel and the moment it clears the tunnel it goes off and gets out and comes back. We can even estimate how long it would take to cross this tunnel behavior this, this tunnel region and this is type 1 mean intermittency the simplest type of intermittency. We can easily estimate how long it would take to get out of this tunnel region as a function of this parameter mu which is supposed to be infinitesimal here. So mu just a little bigger than 0 mu equal to 0 and this was mu less than 0. So let us look at this map here now it says xn plus 1 is mu plus xn plus xn squared so it is clear that xn plus 1 minus xn is mu plus x n squared and in this region the dynamics is essentially differential dynamics because it is making ever so small steps and I can replace the difference equation by a differential equation in time and it is clear this thing here is just the first derivative so it looks like dx over dt is approximately mu plus x squared itself in this region which I have drawn very in a very exaggerated way. But the solution to that is obvious because it says square root of 1 over square root of mu tan inverse x over square root of mu is equal to t assuming that I start near 0 at the or at t equal to 0 and I move out it is of this form here. So that immediately says that x is like square root of mu tan T root mu. In other words to reach a point x to the right of the origin you need a time which is related to the space the x by this relation here and what happens to this when t hits t root mu hits pi over 2 becomes infinite. So essentially it says that to cross this tunnel region the time of crossing t is of the order of 1 over square root of mu that is the time it takes to get out of this tunnel region in an order of magnitude way 
Now that is the reason why if mu is infinitesimal and you get closer and closer it is going to take longer and longer in other words the laminar interruptions the laminar regions in this chaotic time series are going to become longer and longer and it looks like the system is not chaotic at all but in reality it is except that for long bursts of in intervals of time you would just see, see essentially periodic behavior or regular behavior. Now this kind of thing is seen in experiments in a variety of situations in liquids for instance it is very well known that there are models of liquids um, dynamics of liquids fluid dynamics this appears all the time there are many many other areas in semiconductor physics chemical reactions and so on where intermittency has been seen different types of intermittency have been seen. Uh, the reason I said uh, this is called type 1 let me mention this very briefly and perhaps we will come back to this a little later is uh, the slope at this point becomes 1 this is in marginal fixed point. But in higher dimensions if you have maps in more than one dimension then the marginality appears not when the slope hits 1 alone but in the eigenvalue plane of the local Jacobian matrix every time eigenvalues cross the unit circle you have this kind of behavior you have marginality and the three ways in which eigenvalues can cross this unit circle one of them is to cross the value 1 which is what happens here in a one dimensional map they could also cross minus 1 in this direction. And then you have what is called type 3 intermittency which perhaps I will come back to later and then you could have a pair of eigenvalues crossing at complex conjugate points and this will only happen in two or higher dimensional maps and then you have what is called type 2 intermittency we will try to come back to this when we do higher dimensional maps. But right now in one dimensional maps the slope crosses the value 1 and this is type 1 intermittency. And what you need to know is that this phenomenon is very common and it is part of uh, chaotic dynamics and the travel time through the tunnel region can increase scales like this parameter mu like a 1 over square root of mu. Okay. Now let us try to study this in a little more detail and see what happens in a map which we perhaps could solve and see the effect of this marginal fixed point. So let me do a map, a map exhibiting yeah there is no chaos everything gets attracted there yeah. I said that uh, the time that I evaluated was for mu greater than 0 the situation greater than 0 when it was less than 0 it just got stuck there that is the end of it. What, what is you can still use it if you assume in that it was greater than 0. What good will it do I mean eventually things are going to fall into the fixed point right whereas I am interested in finding out what the time scale or the way the, scale, the intermittent region scale as a function of the parameter in a chaotic situation in a chaotic map. When you have a fixed point it just falls in so it is not of great interest to me. In the stable region it will fall in yeah so that oh but that integral is not true anymore right I mean this is not true I mean dx over mu plus x squared is not equal to 1 over square root of mu tan inverse x over root mu if mu is negative right then it becomes logarithms and so on so it is of course the tan inverse function and the log function are essentially the same by analytic continuation right but the interpretations are very different altogether yeah. so it is not just the same tan inverse function okay, okay let us look at a map exhibiting intermittency let us call it the cusp map okay. again this is a map of an interval this time say for convenience I will take it from minus 1 to 1 and it looks like this xn plus 1 equal to f of x sub n equal to 1 minus twice square root of modulus xn and x naught is an element of yeah ah 
between mu equal to 3 to 4 the logistic map has regions or values of mu where intermittency is displayed once again. But the intermittency is not in the map function itself that does not have a slope but you will easily recognize that iterates of this could have this behavior. So again a digression the logistic map itself perhaps look like this at a value mu less than 4 for instance. Okay. On the other hand the iterates of the map would start looking like this. So there are plenty of opportunity for regions like this to be set up there is plenty of opportunity for regions of that kind to be set up which could then lead to intermittency because it is not just the map function that determines the dynamics but all its iterates as well. So that is why the map does exhibit intermittency in between yeah. not at 4 though at 4 it is fully developed chaos it is not intermittent okay. pardon me between 1 plus root 8 not quite up to 4 1 plus root 8 to another value numerically determinable the map has stable period 3 cycles uh, has a stable period 3 cycle. So this is actually periodic it is not intermittent it is actually periodic it is not chaotic in that region at all. So the chaos disappears and then it comes back okay. So now you could ask how does this happen we will do a little more I will bring uh, we will talk about it numerically let me show you the exact bifurcation diagram for the logistic map eventually this has been well studied what happens is at certain parameter values there could be collisions between the chaotic attractor and unstable fixed points and these could lead to things called crises. So there could be different kinds of crises there are boundary crises there are inside interior crises and so on and they could lead to sudden changes in the nature of the attractor and that is what happens in the logistic map. So, so yeah. to some k yeah less than so, 4 uh, yeah is not there fully developed chaos in k itself yes there is when I say fully developed chaos what I mean is the following the entire unit interval is the attractor and that is not true unless mu is equal to 4 because it is not an onto map unless mu is 4 it does not fill up it does not map uh, the unit interval to the full unit interval but rather to a point which is less than that. something like mu over 4 it maps it from 0 to mu over 4 and unless mu is 1 you do not hit the full interval. Okay. So let us look at this map and see what happens yeah there is another question pardon me yeah yeah yes yeah the system gets stuck so the stickiness if you like there are many many dynamical systems of this kind including some Hamiltonian systems where you do not quite have this kind of phenomenon but you have stickiness of some kind and we will talk a little bit about that too yeah. and here you see the mechanism by which it gets stuck as you can see and it is a very I mean when mu is small you could see it really could get stuck for very very long periods of time but there is no doubt that it will escape eventually and then the system becomes chaotic again okay. So it is uh, laminar bursts occur in uh, chaotic bursts occur in the middle of laminar regions and vice versa so that is really what intermittency is. So let us look at this map this will fix many many such ideas of intermittency clearly it is a map which is solvable where you can actually write down solutions and so on explicitly in the following sense. So let us first draw it and uh, let me draw it here and then I come back there this map is from minus 1 to 1 so let us draw a little square here from minus 1 minus 1 1 and 1 here and this is uh, f of x or if you like xn plus 1. as a function of x sub n and that is the origin okay. now this is the bisector once again and it is clear from here that this is equal to 1 minus twice square root of minus x n for x n negative and it is equal to 1 minus twice square root of x n for x n positive okay. and the slope at any point if I differentiate this and compute this f prime of x is equal to 
minus 2 over twice square root of minus x and then a minus 1 again. So this is equal to 1 over square root of minus x for x less than 0 and for x greater than 0 it is 1 over f prime of x equal to minus 1 over square root of x x greater than 0. So the slope diverges at the origin from both sides there is a sort of cusp there and the slope at x equal to minus 1 is plus 1 and x equal to plus 1 is minus 1. So it is immediately evident that this graph goes like this this is infinite out that point at that point and then it is symmetric and falls back there in this fashion and this slope here is exactly 1 and for any point x greater than minus 1 it increases. So this is the region of the marginal fixed point where you could get stuck for a long period of time and in fact what would happen is that you do this staircase thing here and eventually go up you go there and then you get re-injected and so on and so forth. So this map oh by the way the fixed point here is unstable the slope is greater than 1 it is easy to check. Now what would the iterates of this map look like yeah they would even be they would be even more steep than this for example the first iterate would look like this go up like this and come back the slope here would always remain 1 for those maps so there would always be this marginal fixed point but then you have unstable periodic points and all the periodic points are unstable and the map is actually chaotic but you have the effect of this marginal fixed marginally unstable fixed point here and therefore you have the phenomenon of intermittency in this case. We could write the frobenius perron equation down for this so let us do that uh, we need to be able to solve this guy write down the two roots and then compute what the invariant measure is would you like me to do that or do I take it that you will do it yeah you can actually write all you have to do is to write the Frobenius Perron equation minus 1 to 1 dy so let us write this as minus 1 to 0 delta of x minus f of y but f of y for y negative is x minus 1 plus twice minus y in this fashion rho of y plus integral 0 to 1 dy delta of x minus 1 plus 2 root y rho of y. Now you have to convert this to a de to delta functions in y find the slope of the functions at that point divide by the magnitude of the slope and you get a functional equation for rho of x. So this is equal to some functional equation which is fairly complicated on this side and the question is does this equation have a solution or not it is non trivial again the functional equation but this solution has been found and the exact answer in this case in the normalized distribution is 1 minus x over 2 which is quite remarkable because it is an explicit function of x it is a linear function of x looks quite simple and if you sketch this function since rho of x must be non negative so let us plot rho of x here versus x it runs from minus 1 to 1 and at minus 1 it is equal to 1 and at 1 it is equal to 0 so it is simply a linear function of this kind so this is a half and this is one that is what the invariant measure looks like. Now in heuristic terms in crude terms why do you think the map is symmetric about the origin but why do you think the invariant density is piled up on the left rather than on the right rather than being spread out uniformly. yeah there is sort of this this thing here is doing it this marginal fixed point it is unstable it is marginally unstable 
but because of this intermittency because of the fact that the system spends long periods of time here remember ergodicity the measure in any region is proportional to the fraction of the time a typical trajectory spends in that region and it is clear that a typical trajectory a chaotic trajectory would spend a lot of time here. So that is reflected in this fact here but unlike the logistic map where you actually had unbounded invariant density and very little at the middle here it is not like that it is actually quite bounded it is linear it goes down in this fashion okay. and the area under the curve is 1. I might add that this stickiness is actually sufficient to prevent you from having an invariant density of this kind in fact you would have just a delta function here things would get stuck here the only normalizable solution would be a delta function here unless you had this infinity here for reasons I would not go into here you need to have some point in the map other than the fixed point where the slope actually becomes infinite infinitely sharp then under suitable conditions you can have an invariant measure of this kind. So what I would like you to appreciate although I am not proving this is that the behavior here and the behavior here are related to each other you need to have yeah yeah suppose you do suppose or you do, instead of cutting it off suppose you did something like this suppose you came along like this and did this or something like that so it is an then it is not an on to map I would like to have an on to map I would like to have minus 1 to 1 mapped on to minus 1 to 1 no not at all you do not need to have it yeah oh yes yeah okay okay yes yes you need not have an invariant measure of this kind you need to have an invariant measure for example if you took a map like this then there is no guarantee that you have a map uh, an invariant measure of this kind you could just end up with a delta function here and nothing more yeah yeah the behavior will change the invariant measure will change there is no normalizable solution which is non negative of this kind at all you could just have a Dirac measure here you could just have a delta function here and the system gets stuck okay. because what would happen in that case is that instead of chaos the maps Lyapunov exponent would drop to 0 because the effect of this stickiness is so strong it prevents the chaos from happening and actually makes the Lyapunov exponent 0 and you need to have some place here with infinite slope unbounded slope in order for it to actually be chaotic. Yes they may not yeah so the statement is there is no normalizable invariant measure which would do this there is no normalizable invariant measure you need this thing to be no normalizable this density to be normalizable it should not get singular suppose suppose for argument's sake the density went like 1 over x plus 1 what would happen then you cannot normalize that you cannot integrate from minus 1 upwards because it is not it is not an integrable singularity at all so this can happen yeah yeah because you cannot decouple the two because anything that comes here is bound to also go there sooner or later but I am only interested in the time which it takes it does not matter now we are talking about what happens about re-injection we are talking about the entire dynamics not a single passage we're talking about it has to once it gets re-injected here then that differential approximation I made would be a reasonably good approximation provided it gets re-injected in a finite amount of time right so it is the map is actually exploring the entire phase space it is not that trajectories are just exploring the neighborhood of this in which case the behavior is trivially determinable but you need to know what is happening everywhere else uh, what sort of collection region do you have what sort of re-injection do you have and so on all of them play a role and the statement I am making is that in order to have a normalizable density like this you need to have and I am not proving this statement you need to have something which has an infinite slope the slope has to become unbounded at some other point okay. I urge you to verify that this is indeed a solution to this equation 
you have to first convert it to a functional equation and then verify that this is a solution and as I said if you have a non negative normalizable solution you are guaranteed by certain theorems that the solution is unique. Okay. Now where does that get us we need to know what kind of we have the invariant measure we need to know whether it is it is chaotic or not so the first thing we do is to find out what the Lyapunov exponent is so let us do that for this map. So the lambda for this map is integral minus 1 to 1 dx 1 minus x over 2 times log of the slope of f prime of x the modulus of that and that is equal to log of 1 over the square root of modulus x because the slope was 1 over square root of minus x for x negative and minus 1 over root x for x positive in either case if I took the modulus it is just this number here so it is mod x to the minus half modulus x in this fashion hmm. and of course it is an even function and that is an odd function so that portion goes away and you are left with just an integral half log mod x is easy to do and I urge you to do this and the answer will turn out to be a half okay. notice this is negative in the region of integration so that cancels the minus sign and you end up with a half so this is certainly greater than 0 implies chaos but it is intermittent chaos in fact finding this uh, finding this invariant measure invariant density numerically is non trivial you do this by finding a taking a long time series and drawing a histogram and this thing takes a long time to build up here. So you really have to run for a very very long time you have to run a trajectory and you have to leave out the initial transients which would be specific to initial given initial conditions and then eventually you end up with this but this is an analytic solution you can easily check that this is an exact solution to this problem here okay so we have a chaotic map now with a chaotic map you still have intermittent behavior and this is exactly solvable so it is like a paradigm it is like a model like the logistic map now of course you could make this uniform you could make this density uniform without changing any other properties of this map by taking this portion of it and doing exactly what we did for the Bernoulli shift instead of the tent map in other words do this in this fashion so this map function would be f of x equal to 1 minus twice root minus x for x negative but it would be twice root x minus 1 for x positive. that is sufficient to make all the difference because now you have a marginal fixed point here and you have a marginal fixed point here too and they compete with each other so you do not have any right to expect an invariant density of that kind you can write down the functional equation once again and I urge you to do this for this map and verify that in fact the invariant density is a constant so for this new map the invariant density is simply this so the area under the curve is again 1 and it is just a constant so rho of x is just equal to a half for this anti symmetric map the earlier map was symmetric but the invariant density was not symmetric on the other hand here the map is anti symmetric but the invariant density is symmetric in the logistic map and the tent map at parameter value 2 with slope 2 the map function was symmetric about the midpoint and the invariant density was also symmetric this does not pardon me yeah, it will it will have intermittency why not why not. no not necessarily true not necessarily true because what is happened in the crude sense 
is that these regions have kind of overlapped in this case. So once again it is easier to handle than the other map simply because the invariant density is. so I do not have to take weight it with any function of x everything is uniform here. Yeah. The long bursts are periodic terms. Yeah. 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 So yeah. There, is, there is no longer a long burst because it is travelling over the region with equal ease. Ah, but the way it jumps from point to point is not necessarily periodic. Whereas here, once you are here, I am drawing this in an exaggerated way, but once you are here, there is a long staircase behavior. That behavior is lost in this middle region. And again, out here, there is a long staircase behavior which is lost in the intermediate region. So definitely it would look very periodic but not with a constant amplitude slowly increasing maybe or something like that when you are in these regions. So that is what intermittency is it is not as if it is strictly periodic any a function which is monochromatic or periodic would just go on forever minus infinity to infinity. So the periodicity stops definitely and if you look at it with infinite accuracy certainly it is not periodic there is no single period discernible yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. also it will be stuck for, the, uh, for a reasonable amount of time yeah Though for the same am, oh yes yes I agree I agree because of this because of this yeah. once you have a density then the time the fraction of the time t over a long trajectory the fraction of the time that it spends in any interval is in fact proportional to a to b rho of x dx for a normalized invariant density so this is certainly true this is a fraction so if you took a long orbit and you asked how much of the time does it spend in any given region that is measured directly by the integral of the invariant density the measure of that region it is measured it is given directly by that that is certainly true so this map has interesting properties so does the other one but the other one has this extra feature that the map is symmetric whereas this one does not. Now you could ask why did I choose why did I choose something which went like x plus perhaps x squared here if you expand the map near x equal to minus 1 the map function would have a leading term like x plus 1 and a term which goes like x plus 1 whole squared and so on and so forth. So let us see if we can generalize that a little bit and let me shift it to the origin so let us suppose your intermittent maps are like this here and this map function f of x near the origin is like x that is the leading term plus something or the other so plus some constant maybe hmm, multiplied by x to the power uh, alpha now let us take out an x 1 plus this thing here this is typically what would happen near the origin here. alpha if it is a constant if alpha is 0 first of all then nothing interesting happens it just is a map which is going to look like this straight away linear with a slope greater than 1 because its slope is 1 plus c but if alpha is not 0 but a positive number generically if you have a function which is expandable smoothly around this point alpha would start with 1 and then higher powers on like in the case of these maps this map can be written in the neighborhood of this point as x plus 1 plus a term which is x plus 1 whole squared and so on in this neighborhood but in principle you could have an alpha which is positive does not have to be 1 could be greater than 1 could be even less than 1 here. So the degree of stickiness out here as you can see is measured directly by alpha. And for such maps you can actually plot the Lyapunov exponent as a function of the parameter alpha and it turns out that if you plot it lambda versus alpha then if you are if you start at some point like that which is certainly positive because if alpha is 0 this is a map with slope 1 plus c and this is unstable and the assumption is the map is chaotic by its behavior elsewhere. So it starts with some Lyapunov exponent and as alpha increases it is getting more and more sticky here and therefore the Lyapunov exponent actually drops in this fashion 
and it turns out at alpha equal to 1 it drops to 0 and the map is no longer chaotic. So some kind of phase transition takes place on the other hand we also know that in the cusp map for example there is a Lyapunov exponent which is non-zero which is positive and that happens because of the infinite slope elsewhere. So you actually get rid of this stickiness of this point by having a sharp spike somewhere else in the map. So they do not fall in this class of maps these maps do not fall within the purview of this general statement here okay this is a technical aside I want to get too deep into this but let me go back you could also ask can I construct maps of this kind can I construct a map where for example I have not a square root cusp up there and a square root behavior uh, the, the map function which had square root of x and so on what about x to the power one third or x to any other power cube roots and so on the answer is yes you can construct whole families of these maps and whatever exponent alpha you have here you need to have a 1 over alpha type behavior in the slope up there roughly you need to have something which becomes unbounded and therefore the nature of this stickiness here can be related to the nature of the cusp elsewhere to get a finite point. In fact you could construct an infinite family of such maps for which you have invariant densities which are all sorts of prescribed functions of x not necessarily linear functions. This is the inverse Frobenius Perron problem if you give me a, sm a smooth function as an invariant density can I construct a map of which this is the invariant density now that problem can be solved modulo certain uh, qualifications and it turns out for a huge variety of such functions rho of x you can actually find you can tailor make a map whose invariant density the given function would be so that is actually done turns out to be a non not too difficult problem yeah yes because of ergodicity yeah pardon me I can find the map function yeah I can find the map function yeah it is a non trivial problem but it is doable yeah. after all the Frobenius Perron equation is an eigenvalue problem so in some sense you are saying you are giving me the eigenvector and now you go back and construct the kernel so this is can, can I say that this is possible only the system survives yes the whole thing is true only for certain classes of chaotic systems absolutely and in one dimensional maps so things are restricted to one dimension very much so I do not know how these things I, I do not offhand have uh, direct uh, statement about uh, how this generalizes to higher dimensions I am not too sure yeah. so for one dimensional maps a great deal is known much much is known about uh, these chaotic maps yeah the whole thing is we are, we are dealing only with chaotic systems now okay. let me go on to uh, we will come back a little bit uh, later to understanding what coarse graining in phase space is and so on but let me go on to a two dimensional map such maps exist too and let me give you in particular an example of a very simple two dimensional map which is invertible and yet exhibits chaos and this is in fact a model which is used as a model for Hamiltonian systems whereas you know things are conservative so we will look at an area preserving map where you have chaotic behavior unlike the case of the Bernoulli map or the logistic map and so on they do not model conservative systems but now we are going to talk about a map which models a conservative system and yet exhibits chaos and the map is the following it is called the Baker's transformation or the Baker's map because it is supposed to mimic the way in which bakers make bread from dough the baker is not a proper name it is a common noun and it is supposed to model the way bakers make dough which is to take the dough to stretch it and fold it back and they keep folding it back and this mixing is what is producing chaotic behavior eventually we saw in the Bernoulli shift or the tent map you stretched and you folded you stretched and you folded in one dimension now let us do this in two dimensions so the map looks like this uh, you have two variables xn and yn at time n and each of them runs between 0 and, 0 and 1 
and the map function looks like this so here is xn here is yn 0 to 1 and you take this square and do the map following manipulation on it stretch this square by a factor of 2 in the x direction and compress it simultaneously in the y direction by a factor of 2 so at the next stage this becomes like this so this is x and that is y and this is 0 1 this is 2 and that is a half and then cut this piece exactly as you did in the Bernoulli shift and put it on top here so this goes off into this and this is x n plus 1 y n plus 1 so just to see what we have done let us do the following let us take this map and shade this region the other half so I keep track of where it is gone and when I extend it that shaded region has come here and now I cut and put it back and that shaded region has gone there every point on the square has been mapped onto some other point on the square but this is the transformation what is the actual function and it is also clear the area has been preserved you have not done anything at all you have stretched this side by a factor of 2 but you have also compressed the other one by a factor of 2 and you put the square back onto the square but you have mixed up things here so a point here will go somewhere else a point there will go somewhere else and so on in this map and what does the map function look like well it says xn plus 1 equal to 2xn modulo 1. because you are going to stretch and then you are going to put things back y n plus 1 is equal to half y n you brought it down provided x n was between 0 and a half otherwise you added a half to it so you compressed it but then you cut and pasted it back so you actually added a half to it right so this was equal to this so provided xn is less than a half but it was equal to half plus half yn xn was greater than a half and the whole thing is modulo 1 everything is modulo 1 the map is invertible it is definitely invertible because I can tell you precisely which, where each point came from there is no 2 to 1 business here every point has a unique pre image if I started at some point here I stretched so it went to double this and it came to half its height on this point here if I started at some point here then when I stretched it came down somewhere here. and then I cut it and put it back so it went up somewhere here so certainly you can identify the pre image of every point and the area is preserved so it mimics a conservative system on the other hand there are two Lyapunov exponents one corresponding to the stretching or contracting in the x direction and the other in the y direction so you have two Lyapunov exponents and let us call them lambda sub x and lambda sub y and these are easy to write down by inspection what would these be what would be the stretch factor in the x direction it is the original Bernoulli shift so this is log 2 and what would lambda y be log a half absolutely right and it is clear that the area must remain the same because after all under this map what is happening is that dx dy is going to dx prime dy prime this is the area element if you like 
and this is supposed to go like any area element expands so it goes like e to the power lambda x plus lambda y t dx dy that is the whole point about the Lyapunov exponent and it does not change so this cancels that. So the map is area preserving but it is definitely chaotic you are definitely losing information because what happens to the next what happens to the next iterate of this. I iterate once more and I do the same thing then it is not hard to see that you are going to have something like this this region is going to get scrambled up a bit it is going to look like this you increase it a little more it is going to get even more striated and so on. So you are going to have a if you take a cross section here you are going to have a sort of fractal structure this whole thing. So you are certainly mixing up the entire thing so this pulling and cutting and putting it back and cutting and putting it back is like a Baker's transformation okay. and the fact that it has one positive Lyapunov exponent is enough to show that it has chaos in this but now I pointed out that this map and I will stop with this that this map is invertible so you should really be able to recover you are not losing any information in the sense that you should be able to say where you came from is that really true or not we saw in the Bernoulli shift the way to understand the shift was to write x0 as 0 point a0 a1 a2 etc in which case you ended up with x1 is 0 point a1 a2 a3 dot 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 because you multiplied by 2 and threw away the integer part which means you got rid of the knowledge of a0. what would you do for the burn for the Baker transformation one of those goes to the y coordinates so there is a clever way of doing this and I will stop with this and the clever way is to say suppose x0 is this and suppose y0 the initial is 0 point b0 b1 b2 dot 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 then write the pair x0 y0 in the following strange way so put a dot here and write a0 a1 a2 and write this guy backwards b0 b1 b2 in this fashion represent the pair x0 y0 by this strange number and then in the next shift all it does is precisely what it did earlier so you have b2 b1 b0 a0 dot a1 a2 a3 so if this is x0 y0 is represented by this then x1 y1 is represented by this that half which was sitting here has moved over to this side so you have not lost anything in other words you can tell precisely where you came from so this in fact establishes that the map is invertible you are not losing anything at all and yet you have chaos so it is important to remember that chaos does not imply always shrinkage of volume and loss of information you still have exponential sensitivity to initial conditions but yet you could have something which is invertible in the sense of completely solvable if you like and still display exponential sensitivity okay. so I stop here this time and then we will take up uh, some other aspects such as coarse graining next time.